He's going to jump on an airplane, go down to for a day trip down to Arizona or something like that, and come back for business. So, so he's got stuff going on. And <clears throat> in addition to that, they have a little sickness at home with Gracie. So she's got a bad cold or something. Yeah. Well, the way I measure <clears throat> the way I measure sickness is by kids at school, and so far they're 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 all there. So if there's ever a time when there's an excuse for any of them to be gone, they're usually gone. But uh, but they're all there. Is that on a little bit? Very good. Okay. Well, then I don't have to be George Whitfield and <clears throat> talk really loud or something tonight. <clears throat> But anyway, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us this evening. We thank you for the blessings that you give, and we thank you for all the blessings that you present to us. We're thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation we have in him. We're thankful we have a Christian worldview because of Christ and because of your word and because of your truth and because you are the God of truth. So we pray that you'll guide us and direct us in our lives. Help us to be faithful to you. Help us to walk in your truth. And we pray your blessing uh, to be upon us and upon the church and upon uh, the school and upon uh, uh, everywhere where your word is proclaimed. So we pray for your blessing to be upon us this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the last part of <clears throat> this first unit is to talk about this cosmic battle. And there's, a, there's more to the cosmic battle. I mean, I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But... The other thing that needs to be remembered is that when God created when God created man he created man to be in vital connection with him and Satan or the devil challenged the woman who challenged the man. And this relationship was broken. Actually, when you look at man, and you look at man in terms of being body plus soul plus spirit, soul is life. Spirit is the connection that we have to God. Animals have body and soul. Only man has body, soul, and spirit. When this connection with God was broken, man died, you know, always think of death in terms of separation. And this was separated Man continued to be a spiritual being, but he is now spiritually dead. His connection with God. Something is wrong in his relationship with God. Um, <clears throat> like I said, animals are body and soul. When an animal dies, the soul is separated from the body, and it's just the body dies, and the soul goes to the earth. But when <clears throat> man dies, God created man to be this everlasting being. So we're, we're going to be like this. Every man is going to be like this. And that is everlasting. It's not eternal. You get eternal life because it lasts for eternally. But it, I'm not going to put an arrow point on this direction pointing this way because we as human beings have a definite creation. And then we have eternal life. Or everlasting. It's lasting forever. We have that life. But man sinned, and when that sinned, man is destined, like this, to be separated from God, but still living forever. That's true of everybody on planet Earth, That's who's ever lived, every human being. And this took place <clears throat> because of the devil 
And he is the one who deceived the woman. And so the Lord says, the seed of the woman is going to crush your head. There will be a victory that's going to be accomplished. But that is the primary. You have man in a state. This man is in a state of goodness. So there's no f f sinful flesh in him that is encouraging Adam to sin. He's in a state of goodness. Even in a state of goodness, he turned his back upon God and he walked away from God. So, this devil is the primary enemy. Then we have, as a sinful, when we're like this, the body describes us and really describes us in terms of our flesh. And I just put flesh here because it relates to our body, but it also relates to our soul. And this is what is within us that is contrary to us. We have sinful flesh. And that sinful flesh encourages us to sin. And then when you have a number of people, you have the world. And the world is all around us. Our flesh is in us. And I just say that the devil and his is above us. This is supernatural. So when you look at this, you say, okay, the world around us is against us, our flesh is against us, and this devil who is above us is against us. We've got a problem without even talking about the cosmic battle. And when Jesus saves us, we are born again. What is born again? Well, our spirit, we are spiritually born again. So we become, again, that's what the Christian looks like. Now, when the Christian dies, there is separation from the body and the soul. The body is buried in the ground, and the soul and spirit go to heaven. When the non-Christian dies, the soul and the spirit part of that person that is dead descend into hell, and the body is buried in the ground. Everyone will be resurrected in the end. Everyone is resurrected either unto eternal life in the blessing of God or to eternal life in the lake of fire. Those are the only two options uh, that, are, that take place. So here is this, what's that? They, they will go to eternal death. They will go to eternal death. Because that's not life. So it's it's be eternal eternal death. separation from God. Which is death. Yeah, it's, it is. So, but we've got these enemies in us, around us. This tempts us with our desires. This tempts us to conform. And this tempts us to deny the word of God. To separate us from God. And you can tell when the devil talked to Eve, he said, has God really said? So his attack is always against the word of God. When he tried to tempt Jesus Christ, he took the word and he sort of reinterpreted the word in a negative way, in a disobedient way, so that the word would have him, Jesus, worshiping Satan. So, I mean, that's turning the word of God upside down. But So here we have this Christian, and you can say, this is, this is impossible because this remains with us. When we are born again, God has seen fit not for us to be two, two natures. We have one nature. We are spiritually alive. We are born again. We are in right relationship with God. But our sinful flesh remains in us. And God said the principle 
Different people talk about this. The principle of our sinful flesh is there, but we are still tempted to sin by our desires. We have an inward desire to disobey God. And that's going to be with you until you are glorified. It's just there. So you look and you say, okay, now this is the person that is in conflict with the secular worldview. So you're going to have now this body plus soul plus spirit, but spiritually dead in conflict with body soul, spirit, and the remnant of the flesh, it is defeated, but it's still present with us. It's defeated by Jesus at the cross. And so this is where we have this big battle. That's where you have this. And you look at this and you say, <clears throat> We're in trouble. <laughs> we're, we're in bad trouble. Because if it was just a Christian worldview versus a secular worldview, then we say, okay, I understand how those are going to conflict, but, but we'll be fine. But we've got the world working against us. We have the devil working against us and the flesh working against us. And the, the great thing is that we have the Holy Spirit. And we have the abiding presence of the Father and the Son in us as well. So we have resources. We have some really great resources. We have overwhelming resources. But now we have this battle that's taking place. And it's a battle of truth. So we're going to either deal with God and His truth or man and his truth. And this is a battle that's been going on since the Garden of Eden. But it's always this battle. And you have some pretty formative enemies over here. You have some great philosophers. You have people who are really geniuses. Um, the, the smartest of the smartest of humanity. I don't doubt it, but they're spiritually lost. They, they, they don't have a spiritual understanding of the truth. And so, you know, what they are doing is they're trying to put life together. And, it, it, you know, they're going to end up with relative truth. They're going to end up with truth that they're trying desperately to find. They're des desperately to find this absolute truth. These people are struggling. Absolute truth, which we've talked about, exists in God. I'm going to put a dot here that represents absolute truth. The philosophers say, we don't believe in this God. But there has to be, in this universe, there has to be a, a, a point of reference for morality and ethics and our behavior to, to, to give this life some kind of meaningful. So the, they're looking for this. They're looking for this point of reference that is not this. They've rejected this God and they want it here. And I always like to say, and this is what Plato said. Plato said, well, that point of reference is up there somewhere there's a point of reference that says what is good and bad, right and wrong. What is beautiful and what is ugly. Love is beautiful. Hate is ugly. There, there, has, to be, there has to be this reference point up there. There has to be the ideal. And, and, and Plato talked about it as the forms. There has to be the, this original form so that there's this reference point, because otherwise you're going to be left with truth being whatever anybody wants it to be. And these philosophers are looking. Aristotle said, no, it's the thing that we're looking for is down here on the earth. It's inside of things. 
And that's why Plato's pointing up and Aristotle's pointing down, because we're saying, we're, we're looking for this, and we haven't been able to find it. But that's what philosophy is all about. If you want to put a real simple idea on philosophy, philosophy is looking either up, up above or inside of things to find this reference point. Because if we don't have this reference point, we really don't know that good is better than bad is worse. We can guess about those things. We could change those things. We don't know what right and wrong is. How do we have those things? And they, the people say, you know, we have a real sense of what's right and wrong because that's because God put that sense in us. So here we have this, this, this whole battle that takes place. These people are looking to try to find some kind of reference point. These people have a reference point. I mean, in the midst of this battle, as a Christian, we have the Word of God. So we open it up and we said, in the beginning, God. God created the heavens and the earth. We have this God. And you open up the Bible and it says, this God is the God of truth. And he reveals his truth to us. That's why we're holding the Bible in our hands. So we have this, this God who defines truth. And he says, my truth, the, the predominant truth is, one of them is love. The relationship in the Godhead for all eternity is love for one another. Agape love. It's agape love forever, ever, and ever in the Godhead. And he said, so this is the standard for we're to love God, we're to love one another. And you look at the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments spell out what love one another and what loving God means. We have these Ten Commandments. And this is the God side, and this is the man word side. But really, man is made the image and likeness of God, so what he's saying about man pertains to God. He says you're not to murder this person because he's made in the image and likeness of God. When you touch him, you're touching God. You're not to commit adultery, not to steal, you're not to covet, you're not to bear false witness. Those things you're not to do because this person is made in the image and likeness of God. Touch him and, you've, and you're really touching God. You're, you're an offense to God when you touch that man. And so we have to treat these people with that in mind. So God says, this is the principle. And this person says, well, how do we, how do we know that that's love is the rule? How do we know that that's good? How do we know that that's any better than hate? Maybe hate and love, you, you, it doesn't matter which one is which. Maybe it's better to hate than it is to love. Maybe it's better to kill than it is to save someone. So these, uh, you know, this whole thing is in a state of relativism, and it's, it's based upon that question that they, they don't have any objective, that, that form that defines life. I mean, how do you know if you're here that this life has meaning? You don't know. How do we know that it, it has any kind of significance other than what we're doing now? That's why some of the philosophers said, eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die. That's a, that's a philosophy. It's a philosophical statement that it's saying, the only thing that matters is this life. And so live it up. And I would say if you're here, I'd say that's, that's a pretty good philosophy to live by if you're here. Because that's all, that's all this is. This is, this is like do whatever you want to do. Don't be restrained by anything. Just do whatever you want to do because nothing matters. So be good, be bad, be ugly, be dumb, be stupid, be, do whatever. Because it just, it has no significance. So philosophy has been looking for this all along. You come to modernism, and when people really went in the, in the Renaissance 
and then the Enlightenment, when they really abandoned God, and a society abandoned God, and you have this, this whole thing taking place, the philosophers were really depending in, in, in modernism, we've talked about this before, but modernism was sort of the idea that our science and technology will be able to find this. I mean, Plato didn't have science and, and technology to find this, and neither did Aristotle, but we do, and so that is going to help us. So from the late 1700s to the 1800s, all the way into the, the 1900s, you have this, this, this positive expectation that we're finally going to find that form. We're finally going to locate this or this. Well, we all know it's really this, and they're never going to find it. Technology and science and philosophy will never help you to find him. He's a God who reveals himself. He's not a God who is found. So, then you come to postmodernism where we're living today. And the philosophers said, you know, we, we haven't been able to find this. And we haven't been able to find this. And so it doesn't matter anymore. We've lived all these years without it. And because we lived all these years without it, why do we need it now? And so how, how does this play out? And I've, I've, we've talked about this before. It, it plays out with not knowing that there's a difference between a man and a woman. Because we don't know what's real anymore. I mean, this, this, is, this is a struggle for them, but I mean, they're just saying we don't know what's real. We don't know that a little boy can be changed into a little girl if he if his parents want him to be a little girl, or if he wants to be a little girl, or if a little girl wants to be a little boy, we can change all this around. We have the technology that we can kind of make these kind of changes. We don't know that law and order is good. And you say, well, we can't live without law and order. I say, that's true, but if you look at the past few summers, and you want to go on a nice evening walk, I don't recommend you doing it downtown Portland. Because we haven't decided that we're going to support the police and have law and order because we don't know there is law and order. So you say, well, how do you live that way? And I say, you can't. I mean, what this ends up coming to is just complete chaos. But there is... There is no order. There's, you know, and, and people sometimes live it out. You know, the Columbine High School thing where the students went into the high school and they started killing their fellow students. And then they killed themselves. That's postmodernism. That's just postmodernism lived out. They're, they're like saying, you know, we're just going to do what's fun. We're going to go kill people. We're going to kill as many people as we can. And then we're going to kill ourselves because it doesn't matter. Nothing matters. And, you, and, and people are horrified. They look at that and say, that, that, that's, that's terrible. And I say, on what basis is that terrible? On this basis, yes, it's terrible. But on this basis, I don't, we don't really know. We can't know. So that's why we stand up and say, no, there needs to be a man and a woman. There needs to be a boy and a girl. There needs to be law and order. There needs to be prisons and there needs to be policemen. Truth matters. And so we're in conflict with this whole worldview and, and this whole worldview says Nothing matters. Nothing really matters. We can do whatever we want to do. Gary, but and, don't you think by enforcing, let's say, we need police, which we know we do, boy and girl, ultimately it's not going to solve the sinful world without work of Holy Spirit. It's not going to help. So we, is that what we need to stand up for? Or it's an outcome of what we truly stand up for, which is gospel. And well, I think it's a little bit of both. I think it, this is an outcome, like you said. This is where it goes into darkness, real, 
really darkness. At the same time, I'm not a reformer of society. I'm not trying to reform society for these people. But we sort of need to be in. Right. The solution to this is to come to this. At the same time, God intended for the the believers to always have impact upon the world. But without, the first without the Holy Spirit, it's meaningless. It's meaningless. And, and it's impossible. And I said, you know, <clears throat> not only is it meaningless and impossible, but you, you, you know, we have all kinds of obstacles ourselves. We have the world, the flesh, and the devil working against us, and we're supposed to be in battles upholding this for their good. For their good. You know, people want to live in this society, but they want to have this, this belief system. And that's, this is this conflict that takes place. And so that you're going to have this continual tension. Let me tell you one other thing. When you have this, what you end up having is you end up having strong authority that keeps this in order. And when I say authority, I mean absolute authority. Complete authority over the people. And the problem with this is this authority, when, when we want to have impact here, we want to persuade. We want to teach. We want to talk. We want to argue. Argue in a good sense. We want to argue our point of view with these people. This authority, historically, always seeks <laughs> to kill and to eliminate. They, they don't really have the argument to argue. So their way of maintaining their authority is to destroy those who disagree. And when you look at church history, and I've been reading church history, so I'm fascinated by that, but I've been reading church history, there are hundreds of thousands of Christians who are slaughtered for believing what I believe. Salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. And in southern France, and in northern Italy, and in Switzerland, and in Germany, and in Bavaria, there is this slaughter that goes on, and also in the east. And it's a slaughter because it's, it's like saying, these people are the problem. And if you get rid of them, you'll get rid of this problem up here as well. But this is the problem. The way you deal with that is you eliminate it. And they can say it in all kinds of wonderful ways. They can say these people are stealing these people from going to heaven. These people are bad because they're saying we're going to heaven. These people are saying you're not. And so these people have no right to say that. And therefore, they should be eliminated. And it's been sort of my eye opening as, again, I read through the history and you see all of these peoples who are just slaughtered. And you get rid of them. If you, you solve the problem by elimination. And you will see that in in our America, if things don't change. And the change has to be some kind of an awakening or a revival, but you're gonna see the authority saying, this has to be eliminated. And that includes the church, that includes the Christians. And you say, well, that could never happen in America. I say, I hope it can never happen in America, but anything can happen in America because it's happened in all of the places around the world before and we're no different. But I'm just saying that's this cosmic battle. And we can, we can talk about worldviews and we can talk about a Christian worldview and say we believe in God. We have absolute truth because we get our absolute truth from the God who is absolute truth. And he is the love and the joy and the peace and the patience and the kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. He is all of that. that that's, that's his standard. That's his ethics and morality that is given to us and we live under him 
And these people are in a mess. They really are in a mess. And we should have a lot of compassion for these people because, you know, it's just, you know, you look at things and you just shake your head at the, what's going on in our country. And I've said many times before, if you'd have told me 10 years ago what's going on now in our country, I would say, no, that can't happen. <laughs> I'd say, no, we're, we're kind of not really in a great shape 10 years ago, but we're not going, to, we're not going here. So what, what is the solution? Well, what's amazing is in all of, of history, you have people standing up and saying, I stand up for this. That's the first thing that has to happen. I stand up for the truth. I mean, Luther stood in front of a whole room full of people who were opposed to him, both kings and, and uh, churchmen, bishops, uh, legate for the pope, Pope's main leader had all the authority of the Pope with him. He's standing in a room full of this. He's standing at a table with all his writings on the table in front of him. And they say, are these your writings? You need to recant all of this. And so Luther said, well, I need to think about it. So he came back the next day. And he stood up in front and he said, my conscience is bound to the word of God. And in, unless you can persuade me Unless you can persuade me by the word of God that I'm wrong, I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand, I can do no other. May God have mercy upon my soul. Because here he's standing among all these people who want to kill him. And for some reason, you know, it was, it was Huss 100 years earlier, they killed him. For some reason, Luther was, was spared. And there's a number of miraculous instances in his life where the Lord just said, no, you're the one that's going to lead this whole Reformation. And Luther died in his sleep. But I'm just saying, it's individual saying, my heart and my mind is bound by the word of God. That's an easy thing to say with you guys here. <laughs> It's not easy to say that at work. And I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying every, we have to be standing up at work and saying, here I stand, I can do no other. I'm, I'm, but I'm saying it's, it's difficult to stand for the truth in this world. It's just hard. And I don't, I don't want to try to put a happy face on it because I, I, I go to a Christian school and I get to stand up and I get to teach the word of God. And I'm expected to teach the Word of God. And I said, well, that's easy. I go to school and teach the Word of God. It's, that's kind of fun. I, I'm enjoying myself doing all that. It's a whole lot different to go into the workplace with people who are celebrating all kinds of things that we can't celebrate. And the question is, what do we do? And that's, that's a great question. And my answer to that is, I don't have an answer for that. It's tough I, to be faithful to God. My answer is to be faithful to God. If it comes to the place where we are so compromised, we can't, we can't compromise. You, you know, it, it's just, the, those, are, those are the tough things. And, and people, there are some people who stood up and said, I'm gonna die for, my, I'm gonna die for the truth. And they said, well, if you recant, you can live. I said, I cannot recant. And they died. And the person standing next to him says, I'm going to recant. I'm not going to go with this. I, 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 I can't. I don't want to do this. And one of the ones that said that was the pastor of a church. A pastor of a church in France where the Reformation was growing. And by him and by his teaching and by his preaching, these people were all saved. And it comes to the prime of persecution, and this guy says, I'll recant. And these people, they all died. And this guy went into prison, I told you on Sunday, and, and visited with one of the guys, and he said, just recant. Just recant. You don't have to die. And this guy said, the Lord says, if, if you will not stand for me among men, 
I will not stand for you before the Father. And this pastor is the one who's talking to this guy, and it's this guy who knows the truth that he's telling to the pastor that the pastor did not do. And there's no indication this pastor ever changed his mind. I think he was tormented in his whole life, the rest of his life. But it's these people that all got killed. And they stood up and they said, this is what I believe, I can't, I, I can't recant. There comes a point in time where you can do that. There's a lot of, the difficulty is the boiling frog thing, because we're all in sort of the boiling frog. And this culture that's heating up, and you're like, uh, you know, what, what is happening to us? So I, you know, I can, I can see this cosmic battle, I can talk about it, and you say, well, okay, how, how do you address it? And I said, well, I know how I'm supposed to address it because I'm supposed to keep preaching the word of God and teaching the truth. That's what I'm supposed to do. So I know what I'm supposed to do. What am I supposed to do with reference to my society? That question is harder. It's just a harder question. And there's some pastors who think they should be politically active and they go and be politically active. I'm not persuaded of that, but I'm not particularly critical of them. It's just, those are hard questions to deal with. But there has to be a point where you say, here I stand, I can do no other. Here I stand, I can do no other. There, there has to be that point that you come to where you can't bend. And we, we try to be nice. I don't, I don't want to be battling with people. I don't want to be in a big fight with all of these people and trying to... You know, I have arguments, I have things I can say to them, I have all kinds of answers to say to them. At the same time, I don't want to be in this big battle because it, you know, I'd rather be doing evangelism than doing you know, battle for, for truth, but eventually we're gonna to come to that. I mean, it, it's the, the problem is these people need this truth. And the only way they're going to get that is by seeing Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the Savior and the way and the truth and the life that he is. So it's really an awakening that really needs to take place in order for this whole change to, to, to happen. So I can talk about the Christian worldview. I can talk about a secular worldview. A worldview is a belief system used based upon truth used to interpret life. It's a belief system. It's always a belief system. It's a belief system for these people who believe in God. These people believe in man. It's a belief system based upon truth. These people have truth. These people have values. These people have ethics. And these people have morality. They just don't know that it means anything. And it can always change and be a, whatever it is for everyone. These people have morality and ethics and aesthetics that come from God. And I can de easily define these terms. I can tell you this battle is very real. And we're in the midst of this battle. But, but it, is, it is a confusing battle. And what is my hope? Well, it's what you were talking about. My hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit sustaining us and strengthening us to stand firm for the truth. So I know one of the places that is probably coming toward me is the idea that I'm going to probably have to agree to do homosexual marriages or homosexual relationships. I'm going to have to agree to do that um, or not be, able to, not be able to function as a church, will not be able to be a church. Or I could be thrown in jail for not doing that. But I, there, there has to come a point where you say, well, I can't, I can't do that. I can't bend. I can't, at some point when you bend, you break. And so there has to be a point when you're willing to stand. That's all I know. And I, it, it, it may come in a different direction from that. Things usually do. You sort of say, well, if, if I get in trouble, it's going to be this way. Well, I could get in trouble with a lot of ways. They could just say you can't preach. You can't preach the Bible. You can't teach the Word of God. You are the one causing all the trouble because you're doing all of this and it makes a problem for all of these people. And these people are in the majority and you're not in the majority, so you need to either be quiet or be gone. And at some point in time, that's where we say, well, 
this is where I have to take that stand. We'll have to meet in secret then. You can do that. They've, they've done that before. There's, there's always been Christians who have met in secret. And uh, they have continued in secret. I mean, s s since the church began, even in the years when the church was illegal religion, in the Roman Empire, people secretly met in the catacombs. They met and worshiped God. So there will always, you know, Jesus Christ said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That may mean that we're in caves. It may mean that we're in hiding. But the people that were in caves and the people that were in hiding were found and killed. <laughs> I mean, they went looking for those people. And they went to, to search for them. So I'm just, I'm not... I'm not saying we can't hide. I'm saying we can be found. And historically, there were just lots of people who were found. And because when this, this has very uh, power, and when I speak of authority, I speak of two things. I think of power and Money, power, and, and riches. Those are the things that rule this world. And when this power becomes the only power and a very strong power, when, you th when the Antichrist comes, when the Antichrist comes, he's going to have world power. And he's going to find the people who are Christians. And he is going to kill them. And he'll have free reign to do so for seven years. And mainly for three and a half years. But he'll have free reign to find the ones that the 144,000 go out preaching the gospel to. And there's great awakening taking place during the tribulation period. And Satan and the false prophet and the Antichrist are going to go find them and kill them. And there are more... There's going to be so many martyrs in heaven, they cannot be counted. So I'm just saying, there's, there's nothing new about this, and there's nothing that's going to change about this all the way to the end. So this battle is something that we need to be able to face, and it should draw us closer to God. We should depend more and more upon God to have the resources and the strength and to give us the wisdom to know how to respond to people appropriately in business relationships, in worldly relationships. How are we to respond in wisdom? Because there is a wise response. And that has to be the Lord helping us. That's why I say, if I just try to outline it in my mind and say, well, this is what you need to do if you're in this situation, I say, that, that, it's, it's more complicated than that. It's, 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 it's got to be you, depending upon the Lord, giving you wisdom to know how to deal with the situations that you encounter. And I, I just say, God help us. God help us. Because we definitely need help when we're facing this kind of cosmic battle. The nice thing is to know the ending of this and the ending of this cosmic battle is that God always wins. God always wins. And, you know, when you look at Luther standing up and making that statement, Luther goes back and actually he went to the castle. He was guarded for several months. Um, but the Reformation flourished. And the other thing that's really odd to me is when they kill the martyrs, that, well, Tertullian said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. But that's really true. It, it's just amazing that people watch somebody burn to ashes. They burn them to ashes. Then they take the ashes and they throw that in the river if they can because they don't want anybody to make any kind of a memorial to that person but they burn them to ashes and, and get rid of them and, 
and think that that's, that's really, you know, resolving the issue, but I, I just, I can't help but think that, that some of this is coming, and we have to be aware that, that these struggles are very real struggles, and it's, it's happened, it's happened again, but when, you know, it's also the, so interesting when those people are burned to ashes, there's people who stand and watch that, and they're saved while they're watching that. And they believe the very same thing that that person that is being burned to ashes. And a lot of time, it's the, it's the, it's the disposition of the person who's going. I mean, these, the martyrs go to their death in many instances, triumphant. And they have, they, they, have, they have an encouraging disposition. The people look at them and they just say, there's something different about that. And there they pile the wood up around them and they start burning them and they're singing praises to God. And it's like, and the people just look at this and they go, what is happening? And the Spirit of God uses that for many people to come to Christ. Calvin watched people in front of Notre Dame get burned at the stake. And he watched some influential people get burned. I mean, it had a tremendous effect upon the people watching all of this stuff. And I, I don't... I don't know that I could go watch something like this. This, is a, this I, don't, I don't know. It's just it's too bizarre for me. But it's amazing. I say God always wins, but he wins even in the battle. Even in the battle. And the world can think that they're going to wipe out Christianity and wipe out the church and wipe out the Christians. But God says no. And even when they're wiping Christians out there will be people who will believe knowing that they're next. I mean, it seems to me that the worst evangelistic meaning to have is the burning of a saint. Maybe it's not. I'm not, I'm not you know, saying this is a good idea, but I'm just saying it, 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 it's, it's just totally amazing. So there, this is a cosmic battle. It's a cosmic battle that God will win. It may get worse. It's a cosmic battle that God wins. So I never, I never look at this, and I'm, 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 I can look at this and be confused. I can look at this and be concerned. I can look at this and, and be sorrowful. But I can also look at this and be triumphant. Because Jesus said it will be triumphant, and the church is going to prevail even when Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet have free reign on the earth there will still be people coming through all of that believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Totally amazing. Well, we've gone a little long, but let's stop there and take a break. And I think there's some things over there for people to eat, but it's on that happy thought. <laughs> the victory, think, of the, think of the victory of Christ. That's, that's a happy thought.
Okay, we should probably get started. I'm going to move on. I want to talk about what, what I usually say here is I've talked about this Christian worldview and a secular worldview. But now I want to turn the focus. I'm not going to follow this. There's not much to, there's a, a history. There's a great deal of history to follow with this. I want to look at this closer. And if you're going to have a Christian worldview and you have a God of absolute truth, this God has to reveal the truth. You know, all of the philosophers who want to find this point of reference, by definition, they will never find it. Because by definition, what we can touch, we can change. What we can touch, we can change. That's always true. So we can change the laws in Salem with Oregon. We can change the laws in Washington, D.C. We can't, but the, uh, we have legislators that they can change and they can turn the laws around. They can turn things to say maybe the opposite of what they used to say. Whatever we can touch, we can change. So by definition, this, if there is this absolute point of re reference where you have a fixed point of reference for truth, yes and no, good and bad, right and wrong, true and false, if you have this point of reference, then it has to exist in God, it has to in exist in a personal God, and it has to exist in a personal God that reveals his truth to us or we'd never know it. This is one of the reasons why Islam, the God of Islam, Allah, does not qualify because this Allah is, a, is always a transcendent God, which our God is a transcendent God. There's the otherness of God always. But this God is also a God who reveals himself. He's an imminent God. We have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We have a personal relationship with God. Christianity is not a change in philosophy. It's a change in our relationship with God. And God enters into a relationship with us that is a relationship by faith now. One day it will be a relationship where we are face to face with Jesus Christ. That will be terrific. It's terrific to be a Christian now, but I'd like to be face to face with Jesus Christ. That would truly be wonderful, but that's what this God does. He establishes this relationship. Adam and Eve walked away from God. The solution is to walk back to God by trusting in Him. They walked away from faith. The, the solution in coming back to God is to walk back to faith in Him, and so we live by faith. There's a reason why we live by faith, and, and we don't just go home at night and sit down take a deep breath from whatever we've been doing during the day, and Jesus appears. And we have a, a conversation with Jesus for an hour every night. We would just love it. That would be the greatest thing. We'd be saying, you know, why can't we do that? Well, I talked to the Lord about that, and he said, he said no. I said, okay, why? Because he wants us to live by faith. We're going to, in all eternity, not live by faith. We're going to live by sight. We are always going to be trusting in him because he's the source of our being. So we're always going to be dependent and relying and believing and trusting in him. But we're going to be face to face with God. I don't know what we're going to see of the Father. I don't know what we're going to see of the Holy Spirit. But I do know we're going to see Jesus Christ. We shall see him. We shall be like him. So that expectation is there. But in order to have... This truth, it has to be revealed. That's why I said it is not illogical, irrational, and unreasonable to believe that the, a God of truth would reveal that truth to us. Because that's the only way you can know it. <clears throat> if God was just a transcendent God, he would not be a God that was interested in us. And, <clears throat> and the Greeks idea of a God was a God, well, that is totally self-interested. Not interested in people at all, in, just self-interested. That's, why would he be interested in these stupid people when he can be interested in himself? I mean, he is the greatest thing, so that's the only thing that's interest to him. So, there is this revelation that takes place, and 
there are several ways, uh, several aspects of Revelation. I'm going to talk about those. But the first thing I want to tell you is how that Revelation turned philosophy upside down and turned the philosophers upside down. And we've talked about this before, and I, I, I'll be, try to be quick in re repeating this. But the word for love in the Greek world before Jesus Christ. So we're talking about the empires. You have the Babylonian, you actually have the Egyptian Empire, then you have the Assyrian Empire, then you have Babylonian Empire, that means in the Persians, primarily the Persians, and the Greeks, and the Romans, and then Jesus Christ came during the Roman Empire. But the Greek Empire had a great deal of the philosophers were also a great influence in, in the world, and their idea of love is the word eros. Eris is a self-love. It's the love that says, I want to acquire for myself. We have that kind of aspect of love. I've, I've told you before, I don't know if I remember telling it to you, but I've been told that you're not supposed to love chocolate cake. <laughs> you can love people, you cannot love objects. That's what I was told. I said, that's not true. Because you can have this kind of love for chocolate cake. Because that kind of love says, I want to acquire some of that for me. I'm interested in satisfying me. Oh, I love chocolate cake. Chocolate cake is the best. So I say, that's what I want to acquire for myself. And it's like self-centered, it's what I want. That's why this word is the word for erotic. Because this can be erotic love. It's the total satisfaction of me. It's the satisfaction of self. But the Greeks believed that this God, if there was a God, that he was a God of Eris. And therefore, a demiurge was used to create us. This is a lesser God, but he's the one who did the creation of, let me erase this, of mankind. And the world. This kind of God, why, why would he create a bunch of people that he doesn't need? There's nothing about, he doesn't look at any of this and say, oh, I'd like to have that for myself. This is the chocolate cake I would like to have for me. He looks at this and he says, there's nothing there I like. I look at sinful man, even when you look at sinful man, you know, there's nothing there that I want. They don't have anything I want. I am perfectly satisfied in me. This is a God who is, in many ways, we, speak, we can speak of our God as being totally self-satisfied with himself. I mean, God is completely adequate, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in perfect relationship with one another. God did not create the world because he was lonely. He didn't create the world because he just felt like he needed more people to love. He created the world because he wanted to share his grace, mercy, and truth with people. I mean, with us. He wanted for us to worship him and to be for him. And, uh, but here you have this Eris God, and, and Eris is, is the, 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 to acquire, to, to get for myself. Along comes Jesus Christ and the Bible, and there's another word, and... Agape. And it is our God that is this love. And this is a love that I always say it's unconditional. If I could write, I can't write. It's un 
It's purposeful. It is sacrificial. It is eternal. It's purposeful and seeks our greatest good. It's unconditional because this love comes from the heart of God. It's a love that comes to us not because we deserve it. That's why we speak of grace. God does not love us because he sees something in us that he that he sees as being worthy. There's not anything that God sees in us that causes him to love us. That's hard to understand. That's hard. I, I can say it, but I don't really com comprehend that because I always, when you love someone, it's always something you see in them. But that's why we can have this kind of love for our enemies. You can love your enemy because this is not brotherly love. There's another word, phileo, is the word, or phile is, is a word that, that is brotherly love. And brotherly love has some kind of connection to it. And that's why in that famous statement where Jesus comes to Peter, he said, Peter, do you agape love me? And Peter said, Lord, 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 we are phila. Filet, we, we, we're best friends. We're, we're, we have this brotherly love for one another. So Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Then he said to him again, do you, do you have this kind of love for purposeful, a love that is not based upon anything you see, it's a base, that comes out of your heart that seeks the greatest good of the one loved at the sacrifice of self and never stops. And so, Peter responds again by, this, this, this is a little bit too cold. This is not cold at all. But it seemed a little too cold for Peter because he wanted to say, Lord, I, I know I betrayed you. I, I mean, I'm... I said I didn't know you. I denied you. But Lord, you know we're best friends. So the Lord said the third time, are we best friends? And you think Peter would run to this word and say, Lord, we're, we're agape friends. <laughs> but he said, Lord, you know that we're, it grieved him that the Lord said that to him. But he said, Lord, you know that we're best friends. I mean, he still continued to use that because this, this was just, but the Lord says, you need to love me. Where do you get this kind of love? And the answer is you have to get it from God. It, it's from the heart of God. So you say, I, I don't have this kind of love. If it's unconditional, then it can't be a love for the person because of what I see in the person. It has to be a love that I get from the heart of God. That he has to give me that love. I can't drum it up myself. So if I'm supposed to have agape love, it has to be from the heart of God. Then I can love my enemy by seeking greatest good in a sacrificial way. And this defines Jesus Christ. He comes not because we are worthy. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wonderful person like me. No. That saved a wretch like me. How sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. It's unconditional. And we say, why, why did God love me? Why didn't God love that? There's a lot of other nice people, nicer than me, that I see, that I would think that God would be nice and love them. 
Why does God love me? And the answer is, because he loves me. We love him because he first loved us. Why does he love me? And the answer is, because he loves me. That's a circular argument. He loves me because he loves me. In other words, it's in the heart of God. I don't, I don't know why he would love me, but it's in, it wasn't because of something in me. It, he loves me because he loves me. From his heart that's overflowing in the love of God and overflowing in the grace of God. And he seeks my greatest good. This is what Jesus Christ was doing on the cross. He loved us when we're sinners. He loved us when there's nothing worthy about us that he died to save us. And what was his purpose? To seek our greatest good. What is our greatest good? Well, the greatest possible good for us is that we could be conformed to the very image of Jesus Christ and be as much like God as we could possibly be and still be the creation. And that's what God is doing. He says, I'm going to justify you. I'm going to, I'm going to forgive all of your sins. I'm going to clothe you in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And you're going to stand before God the Father. God the Father is going to look at you and say, you're perfect. And then he's going to make you holy. He's going to completely set you apart in this process over time that he wants us to see. He could have done that immediately. We could be justified, sanctified, and glorified. Go to heaven immediately. It would all be done at one time. It would be real simple. But God says, I want you to be sanctified over time because I want you to see the victory that I give you over sin and death. I want you to experience death, but I want you to go through death. Death is no longer your conqueror. You, Jesus Christ, has conquered death, but I want you to go through it. So we will go through it unless the Lord comes. But God says, I'm seeking your greatest good at the cross of Jesus Christ, at the sacrifice of himself. All of the benefits that we receive as the greatest good, we receive from the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We don't receive it from the sacrifice of ourselves. And I have never contributed one righteous deed to my salvation. It's all contributed by the righteousness of Christ. And you look at that and you say, well, isn't there anything that we've done that has been pleasing to God? I say, you can do things that are pleasing to God, but what pleases God is when he does things through us when he's accomplishing his purposes in and through our lives. When we depend upon him and, you know, Moses was going to go and deliver the people all by himself. So I'm a, I'm, I've, got the, I've got an education, I've got the language, I've got the authority, I've got the, the power, I've got the presence, I'm going to go and deliver the people. So Moses goes forth to deliver the people and God says, I don't need you. He goes in the wilderness for 40 years until he doesn't know anything. And now God says, I want to use you. Why? Because he wants us to know that what pleases God is what he does through us, not what we do for him. God loves everything that we do to be like this. It's a circle. Back to him. He gives us grace. We give him glory. And this, this, is, this is this circle, this loving circle of God. What pleases God is God. God pleases God. We're, that's the same thing as this God, but this God wants us to share in what pleases God. By depending upon him and our heart being transformed here. So I always draw the circle. I draw a circle around the heart and then I go back here. Because it's the glory of God changing our hearts, transforming us and empowering us to glorify, to worship, to honor, to be obedient to God. That's what pleases God. This whole thing turned Greek philosophers on the, I mean, the Greek, I can imagine the Greeks hearing that and they say, that is not love. This was a Greek word rarely used. And Christianity used it big time and gave it definition. And the definition that I have that, you can see that in John 3.16. For God so loved the world. Why did he love the world? It doesn't say we, it, for God so loved the world because the world was so lovable. No, it doesn't say that. It said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever would believe in him would receive eternal life. God's purpose is their greatest good. And that they should live eternally. I mean, it's, it's all there in, in that. And John 3.16 would have turned these people crazy. Because these people, and, you know, very simply, these people looked at, this relationship like climbing a ladder. 
And the first part of this is for you to get a sense of what is beautiful, then for you to get a sense of what beauty really is, and then for you to become beautiful. So it's kind of like this is experiencing the beautiful things in this world. Beauty of love, the beauty of truth, the beauty of goodness, the beauty of trees, the beauty of people, the beauty of things to just come to a complete, to be absorbed in what is beautiful, and then to be absorbed in the principle of beauty, and then to become the principle of beauty. And when you do that, you become God. So the Greeks were climbing this ladder. The idea that there was a God who comes down to them and seeks their greatest good, this God could care less. He, he's, he's only self-focused. He can't even create. There's a demiurge, a secondary kind of God that created the world. Because God, this God would never do that. This is the greatest God. We're climbing the ladder to be like him. And people always ask me, well, did anybody of the Greek philosophers climb to the top of the ladder? <laughs> and I said, well, they may have thought they did, but no, they never climbed to the top of the ladder because there isn't a ladder. And you can't, you can't reach God and become God. This is, this, is a, this is like a man-centered view of God. All the world religions, every world religion except Christianity, has a ladder in it. Every single one. It's a ladder where you do good things to make yourself, and sometimes you meet God on the ladder, but never is it without a ladder. So the Greeks sort of, and when you think of Greek philosophy, don't think philosophy and religion. It's religion is philosophy. Those two are wedded together. In, in, so the, we separate philosophy from religion. The Greeks didn't do that. It's philosophy and religion. So that's, but I'm just saying, John 3.16 would have been infuriatingly awful to the Greeks. Just that one verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So all I'm saying is this revelation, it sounds like, well, here's God, he reveals his truth, he reveals his truth to our hearts. This truth, this revelation turned the, turned the world on its head. And the Greek philosophers hated it. I mean, I, they hated it because it just, it denied everything that they were doing and everything they were thinking, everything they were believing. They're living by faith. They're living by faith in a God that doesn't exist. They're living by faith in man. They're believing in faith in themselves. This is faith in, in this God who comes down. That's why I said, I love to say in church, this is come down religion. This is a God who comes down to us. Why? Because of his love for us. This is a God who seeks to acquire only those things which are really good, which means he's only seeking to acquire himself. This is a God who is self-sufficient and could only be interested in what he is, but instead his interest is in us. That's amazing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That's, that's wonderful truth. So we're just starting to talk about revelation, but the only thing I want to say about this eros and agape is how it impacted the world. And it entered right into the cosmic battle because you've got a cosmic battle going on forever after this world comes down. By the time, by the way, Jewish religion had a ladder in it. And it was meeting God halfway. Because the Pharisees thought that they were climbing a ladder. They kept on falling off the ladder, but they keep falling the ladder to meet God who comes down the ladder to meet them. And Jesus said, no, there's no ladder. And there's no reaching up to God. God is the one who comes all the way down to meet us and save us because he loves us. It's great truth. Well, we'll stop there. There's more to say about revelation. There's different kinds of revelation. I'll talk about those different kinds and the way in which God reveals himself. It's just important to see all of that. But it's wonderful truth. This should, this, this, helped me a lot when I could just, these two words, eris and agape, 
Actually, I read a book that was written by a man who lived a long time ago, but he wrote on Eris and Agape. And he wrote about this, and it was just, it sort of put a lot of things in place for me. But clearly, we have a God who is an agape loving God. But let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings you give. We're thankful that you love us because you love us. And it's not that there was anything so wonderful about us that you loved us. There's something quite wonderful about you for loving us. And you sent your son. You gave yourself to seek our greatest good by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and your love never fails. And we rejoice in that truth, and we know that your revelation turns everything and puts it right. And the world was headed in the wrong direction, and lo and behold, you revealed your truth, and everything got turned around. We're thankful for your truth. We're thankful for the blessing of your truth. We're thankful that you never give up on this world or on us and that you're faithful to the end. So may your blessing be upon us and encourage us in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.